Hi guys, welcome to another um, Teaching Monday. Uh, last week in our Bible study, we had someone asked about um, nullification and a few things like that, and I thought it would be a good thing to go over again. I think we're going to be talking with someone this weekend about the same kind of stuff. And um, it's an interesting concept. And basically, when we talk about nullification, we're talking about how to nullify pagan influences in our lives. Uh, so let's start out by looking at um, what Paul said. And this is 1 Corinthians 10. And basically, we won't look at the first part, but um, this first part here is a warning against idolatry. He gives lots of examples about idolatry and how it has no business being in the church. When you get down to this bottom part, it basically says that um, uh, the idol isn't anything in particular, but you don't want to be practicing idolatry. So in other words, if someone invited you to come to a Buddhist temple and celebrate a certain Buddhist holiday where they sacrifice a calf and cook it and you get a steak and that kind of stuff, uh, friendly type thing, the answer would be no, because Christians don't participate in pagan rituals. It's forbidden. And that's what he's saying here. You can't sit at the bread of or at the table of Christ and the table of Belial at the same time. So in the things that the Gentiles sacrifice to sacrifice to the devils and not to God. So he's talking about that, and that, and that makes it very, very clear we don't do that. So, but at the same time, then he goes into the other part of this. So what is nullification? So basically. Most people look at things as being it's either godly or it's pagan. And there's actually a three-tiered system. It's either godly, secular, or pagan. And what you're wanting to do, you can't take a demonic thing and make it godly. Uh, but you can nullify the, the demonic part and make it secular. So let's see what he says here. We don't participate in pagan rituals. We don't go into a temple and do anything. But what about the pagans that are all around us and the things that happen? You go over to a friend's house and they have little idols in their home if they worship Diana or Zeus or something like that back then. So he says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful to me, but some things don't edify. So let no man seek his own but every man another's wealth. Wealth meaning prosperity. So in other words, don't just think of yourself. Think of what may hurt or help someone else. He says, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, eat asking no question for conscience sake. Now, many people, and I remember going through seminary asking professors, what in the world is a shamble? And the only thing I got was it's kind of a meat market. Well, you don't sit down in a meat market and eat, though. It's be, be more like a restaurant or something. So there's this kind of confusion on what we're talking about. Something sold in the shambles. Why wouldn't I eat it? Why? What, what is a shambles? We'll come back to that in a minute. But Paul is talking about something that's that's quoted in an ancient Jewish work called the Avodah Zarah. And uh, we'll get to that. So whatsoever thing is sold there, eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them believe not, that believe not, you know, pagans, bid you to go to a feast at their home, not in a temple, and you're disposed to go, you're friends with them, you might, might try to witness to them, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for the sake of conscience. Okay. So, be, and this this is the point. If I was to say, uh, I have to ask a question first. Was this steak sacrificed to Zeus? I'm giving attention to um, Zeus. Uh, wh why would I care? Well, if I eat it, Zeus is liable to zap me. It's almost telling the um, pagan that you believe Zeus is something. The opposite or the proper thing to do is to nullify. It's like, I really don't care. It's a stake. What's the difference? 
Now, we're not going to participate in a pagan ritual because that's forbidden. But if I go to a friend's house, where did he get the meat? Where did he get the plates? Where did he get the table? I don't care. It's it's just common now. It's not being used for a pagan ritual in a temple. So like, for instance, if you were to go into a, a pagan temple and take a sacred bowl and put some cornflakes in it and some milk and start eating it, they would consider that blasphemy. You're taking something they consider holy and using it for secular things. So that nullifies uh, the, the bowl, basically. So the whole consense is, in that case, don't even bother with it. Don't ask because you're giving an idea or this fake concept of this God in some sort of reality, except there's an exception. But if anyone say to you, this has been offered in sacrifice unto idols, don't eat it for the sake of he that showed it to you and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not of yours, okay, but of the other guy. And then he asked the question, why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? So what he's saying here is, I go to my Buddhist friend's house. I'm going to try to witness to him. We're going to talk about stuff. I'm going to show him that I, God loves him and, and talk to him about that. And he gives me a sandwich. I don't ask, has this been sacrificed to a demon? You know, because then... I'm calling him demonic. I'm giving uh, credibility to his religion. And I want to say, well, it was a good guess on your part, but no, you're, you're missing all the history. That's got nothing to do with anything. They weren't gods. They can't help you. Why don't you come be a Christian? I can introduce you to the real God, you know, and begin to treat him as a viable human being. Refuse to participate in a pagan ritual in a temple and that will show him that you're serious about your religion, but then treat him as a friend. And so that's what we're talking about. But then if someone else comes up and, and is worried about it, why would they even be worried about it? If you eat the sandwich, you're going to be demon possessed. Well, that means they have what the church fathers would call uh, a theology uh, of the... Um, can't think of the name of the group. Anyway... Uh, their theology basically says that they could become demon possessed and demons could hurt them by, you know, eating a sandwich. And that may be true for non-Christians, but Christians are filled with the spirit. We don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But he's worried about it and you don't want to scare a new believer. So the point is you don't want to offend a new believer that doesn't understand what's going on. It would be better to offend the uh, pagan than a new believer, okay? The new believer has just become or is thinking seriously of becoming a Christian. The other guy may not care, may never become a Christian. So you want to make sure to take what Paul would call the weak brethren. They don't understand. So until they understand, let's, let's be careful with them. So this kind of a thing. So basically, I'll come back to this, but the, the Shambles is a place, of a, a restaurant uh, that would be owned by a pagan. So in other words, in the, in the restaurant, it's a public restaurant, okay, and or public grocery store. You go in there and you buy things, but the owner is a pagan. There's graphic depictions of gods and goddesses around or little idols and stuff like that, but they're decoration. Now, if we were to buy the store, we would take all that out, make it a Christian store, you know, but he's a pagan. It's a store. We're buying food. So it's there's a difference between going to a store that has decorations of idolatry because the owner is an idol worshiper and going into a pagan temple and uh, doing a pagan ritual or participating in something. So that's where we draw the line at. And I'll show you why this is important in a little bit. Um, so uh, if, if he's offended, make sure not to do that for his sake. So he asked the question, if I know the sandwich is not demon possessed, God doesn't care. I don't care. It'd be a good witness to sit down and treat the guy as a brother and eat a sandwich with him and then talk to him about the Lord. Why would I care? 
Well, because you might offend or hurt a brother in the Lord. And we try to take care of each other. So my conscience should always be governed by someone else's weakness. Okay. So it's just like if, if, um, if I'm allergic to certain food and you know that and you invite me over, don't serve me the food that will make me sick. I, I, feel I have a weakness. It's not your fault. It's mine. I messed up, you know. But we have mental and physical infirmities and we have to be mindful of each other on those. He goes on and says, uh, why should my liberty be judged by another man's conscience? The answer is, for if by grace I be a partaker, why is, am I evil spoken of for which I give thanks? If it's just a sandwich and I pray to God and thank him for it, and it's a witness to this guy and I'm doing the work of the Lord, why would that be called evil? He says, therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. So we have to put uh, tears on things. If we're all mature Christians, we should be able to do anything without offending each other. And we should all know exactly what we're doing, where the lines are at, what's sin and what's not. And it should be pretty easy if we're all mature Christians. If we have weak brothers or baby Christians, depending on what lifestyle they came from, we have to be careful with them. So, Give no offense neither to Jews, nor to Gentiles, which would be the pagans, nor to the church of God. Even as uh, I, I please all men in many things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they might be saved. So this is that concept. So basically he's saying in the first part of the chapter, don't enter a pagan temple, don't participate in a pagan rite. However, if there is a shambles feel free to eat there buy food there go in and chit chat with the guy witness to the guy maybe you can get him saved but if somebody a new believer a weak brother as paul calls it in first corinthians 1 through 3 if a weak brother says that you you might it's it's been sacrificed to demons you might get you know he's okay calm down i won't go there tonight so you don't have to worry Okay, I'll, I'll cancel. Okay, but you and I need to talk. You don't leave the weak brother in false theology. You need to come and say, okay, I'm not going. Therefore, I can't get killed. Everything's fine. Come over to my house. I'll cancel. But you come over to my house. We're going to take care of this once and for all. We're going to explain how things work so that you're not scared. I want you, you know, I'm your brother. I'm going to take care of you. So that's what we should be doing. So along this lines, let me show you uh, another thing or how this works exactly. So the concept of the shambles, the concept of pagan temples and those things. You've probably read all through the Old Testament uh, about Asherah groves or Asherah poles or Asherah trees, things like that. Some people, uh, they're, they're called pan-Babylonians. They think everything is pagan and they don't understand that some things are secular. Okay, and the concept of nullification, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, so let me show you something. I'll, I'll ways back, I wrote a book on uh, the modern, let's see, ancient origins of modern holidays. And in one section in there, I'm covering Christmas and different things. Since a lot of people think a Christmas tree is an Asherah tree, as an example, I went ahead and researched it. And this is what's really cool because. Um, Maybe you're on that line. You have a family member that says, I don't see a problem with a Christmas tree. And someone else says, well, it's pagan. Well, how do you know it's pagan? Because it's a tree. You decorate it. You know, it sounds kind of like that. Well, if it sounds kind of like that, maybe it is. How would we find out once and for all what it is? So let me show you. Here is a picture from that book. And this is what an Asherah tree or an Asherah grove is. And sometimes it's translated an Asherah pole. You share a pole is actually the idol. And as you can see right here, this is a representation of a Shara uh, from some, several statues that they found. But the concept is a Shara was a, um, an earth goddess, a mother goddess. And the concept is you don't want to chop down a tree because that would kill it. It's, it's a nature type religion. So what they would do is dig a hole, go into a cave, 
uh, something that's natural for Mother Earth and have their Asherah idol. So if they would plant trees to become Asherah trees, they would plant not, not just one, but multiple. And as you can see here, the concept is you've got four or five trees uh, fairly close together, depending on what kind of tree it is. You let them grow up and then you shape the branches so that they connect to each other and it forms this really big canopy. So now you have a canopy for the idol. Okay. And so this concept is these, these are Asherah trees. So the idea is you're walking through the forest and there's lots of trees and you come across, maybe the idol is not there, but you come across these trees that are formed and you can tell that it's man-made. They've, they've intertwined them and maybe there's decorations and stuff in there. However, they decorated it and you can tell, oh, this is an ancient Asherah grove. So the concept is that you nullify it by destroying it. You don't have to destroy the trees. You have to put the trees back to where they normally would be. Go ahead and prune them so that they're not together, so there's no canopy. There's no place for the idol. Now, anciently, they always said if you find an idol, you're supposed to destroy the idol so people can't worship it. So that's fine. And there's a lot of laws about this, but it's really interesting to see. But you don't need to destroy God's trees. Some people actually worshipped the trees as being tree spirits, that kind of stuff. And the, the ancient texts say you, you don't want to run out and cut down the forest just so people can't worship the trees. So that's the concept we're, we're looking at. We just went through 4th of July. And I wanted to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about, how pagans develop this kind of stuff. Uh, George Washington, for instance, the founding father of our nation, was a Christian, uh, at least as far as I know, he was a Christian. Uh, the nation is based on Christian principles, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we have the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It all focuses on uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, and the freedoms that we have. And that's a wonderful thing to celebrate. The 4th of July was picked not for any other reason other than that's the date they sound, signed the declaration. So the 4th of July then is the date which we started this nation that we honor and we respect. We don't worship anything. Nobody worships George Washington. So it's completely secular. Okay. And even the ancient laws the, they had in, in the ancient laws of kings and the Jewish laws, uh, the concept is if you enter a Gentile city and they have a big statue of their king and maybe a date on it, like when the empire was founded, stuff like that, nobody prays to the king. They don't think the king is a god. He's just a king, the founder of the empire. Then that's perfectly fine. It's not an idol. Nobody cares. Jews wouldn't even have the, the statue, you know, but that's Jewish law for Jews. Gentiles are fine doing it different. But the minute anybody bows in front of it and prays to it or prays for it or anything along those lines starts involving some sort of religious rite, then it becomes an idol and it needs to be destroyed. So my example of George Washington and a 4th of July, suppose that happens and then about 100 years later, some weird cult develops that thinks that George Washington was an incarnation of God and they start sacrificing goats or something to him. And they have these special statues with George Washington, maybe with horns or something like that. And that's their kind of a thing. Well, that's a cult. They've made it into paganism. Okay. Uh, what we would want to do is not go into a museum and destroy every statue of George Washington. If you happen to be walking through the forest and you find uh, the remnants of this cult, I would destroy the statues that are actually idols. If there's a chance people are still around that might be worshiping it. Otherwise, it's just an ancient thing of history. So you don't want to participate in a rite. If the rites are still going on and you have legal authority because it's your land or something, destroy the idol. That's what we would do. But you don't go doing the other stuff. So uh, suppose then after 100 years after George Washington, this cult sp springs up and does all this weird stuff. And then say in, by another 100 years, the cult is completely gone. 
nobody is like that anymore. It's completely dead. And so you've got someone, and we call these people pan-Babylonians because they think doing things secular or pagan, that somehow playing baseball is a sin or something like that. And so let's say that you've got one of these people, they're going through the forest and they find this ancient statue and this weird stuff. So they start researching it to find out what this is. And it turns out it's that ancient cult that worshiped George Washington. Okay. So now they stop their research. They don't go back any further. They think, oh my God, we need to go destroy all the statues of George Washington. How evil this guy must have been to allow himself to be worshiped and oh man, this is horrible. We need to destroy the Constitution. We need to destroy statues of George Washington. There's one in my in my library. I'll go destroy it, you know, because it's an idol. They don't have the complete picture. They have a zeal for the Lord because they love the Lord, but they don't have a complete picture. And what we need to say is say, kind of train them. It's like continue the research and go on back. A hundred years before this cult did the weird stuff, there was a real George Washington and there was a real constitution dedicated to the real God and there's no problem. So don't do the pagan rites. If someone is doing the pagan rites, stop them if you can legally. Destroy idols, not statues, history statues, just the idol ones. And that's the concept that, that we would have. And that's the concept of nullification. You know, you may have heard some people say like, I brush my, my teeth every night with toothpaste. And then some pagan makes a ritual out of it. So what, I can't use toothpaste anymore to brush my teeth? I was doing it first. You know, it's that kind of a thing. You just need to nullify it. If the pagan is using a red toothbrush and he's reciting a certain scripture or something or certain text or chanting while he's doing it don't use a red toothbrush and don't chant anything while you're doing your brushing your teeth so that people can if they come in and see you doing that but you're doing it wrong doing what the ritual i'm not doing the ritual i'm just brushing my teeth oh okay so that people know so there's this thing called, again, we talked about it, but this, there's this thing called the Avodah Zara. And I want to share, share with you a little bit about this. This is interesting, and this is the section on the Shara trees. This is just one example of many uh, that talks about these kind of things. So in this section, I'm talking about Christmas. I get into Christmas trees, and I say some people try to say that Christmas trees and a Shara tree. Well, they're both trees. They're both used in a kind of a ritual. So they might be similar, or even if they're not exactly the same, it might be something that we shouldn't do, or, you know, it's a legitimate question to ask. So the first question we want to do is, what is an Ashera tree? Where do we get this idea from? What do we do if we find one? You know, this kind of thing. And again, it's the ancient texts talk about this. It's not one tree. It's a group of trees to make a living canopy or sanctuary for the idol. It's a Mother Earth thing. So if I was to cut down one of these trees and take it home and decorate it, they'd be really ticked off. I'm desecrating their sanctuary. It's a living tree, and now I've killed it. Also, think about it this. If, you've, if we've got worshipers of Asherah, and I take one of their trees, and I take it home, and I put Christmas tree on it and decorate it the Christian way, instead of saying, Hail Asherah, it says, you know, Praise be to Jesus Christ. That's going to be, as far as an Asherah worshiper would be concerned, that would be sacrilege. Okay? So I'm obviously, I've nullified it. It's no longer good enough to be an Asherah tree. Number one, I've killed it. Uh, number two, I've made it into something Christian or pseudo-Christian or whatever. I've, I've, I've messed it up. So at that point, it's nullified. Okay? So let's look at this. Um, uh, in the Mishnah, there's a section called the Avodah Zara. It means foreign worship, basically. And it's got a section about all sorts of different kinds of, of idols that they worshipped and how they did things. Um, it talks about there's three kinds of Asherah trees, and you do different things with them. So, And they do this with idols and houses and stuff like that. 
There are trees that are specifically planted for the worship of Astarte or Asherah. There is a tree that grows wild, but then is pruned and kept uh, pruned for an Asherah tree. And then there's a tree that's grown wild and someone just put an Asherah uh, idol under it. So those are the examples they give. So if this was just a tree and somebody put an Asherah idol under it and you find it, you destroy the idol, you don't bother the tree. With the idol gone, it's no longer an Asherah tree. It's just a tree. If I pulled a Shara out and put a baby Jesus under it, it might be a Christmas tree. Kind of. Not really. But it's that kind of thing. But I've messed it up for them. Now, they could come back and put another idol there and reuse it. But they could do that with any tree. And again, you don't want to cut the forest down. That's actually forbidden in Scripture uh, back in, in the law. Even when you're at war, you don't cut all the trees down to mess up the place. So if these were normal trees and you can tell somebody pruned them and got them, got them going and made them into this canopy, then you destroy the idol if there's an idol there and just prune these trees back so that they become normal trees again. So that's no longer an inter, interlocking canopy. If there's any decorations in them, you take it off. Now they're just trees. Now you can just leave it alone. Because it takes a long time for somebody to interwave all these branches. They have to kind of grow into it. Now, if this was like six trees planted in a special row to do this, and it was planted and dedicated as an Asherah grove, then at that point, you would go ahead and chop these trees down and destroy everything because it's an Asherah grove. And so that's the kind of thing that they're talking about. Um see here they had they say the same thing with uh, buildings so say somebody creates a temple you know and then later on it's defunct or whatever and it you you end up owning it or whatever you tear the temple down you destroy it right so nobody can do paganism anymore well what if down the street um, the builders make my house and then four or five other houses and they're just houses so they're secular. They're not religious at all. But then my neighbor sells his house to somebody who comes and says, this would make a good study center. So they turn it into a Buddhist temple or something like that. They put all sorts of weird idols on it and decorate it. And they, they take out the living room wall and put a nook in it so they can put the idol in. It becomes a pagan temple. Now, if, if he dies or moves away, it, Nobody pays him any money, so he closes it, whatever, and he sells it. You don't have to destroy that because it wasn't created to be dedicated as an Asherah tree or an Asherah temple or anything like that. The concept is you put it back to the way it was. You take out the nook, you destroy the idol if it's there, go ahead and put the walls back, take off the decorations. Now it looks like any other house. It's back to being a house. There's no reason to destroy the house. It's just a house, but you want to destroy the idols. So they make it very clear in this kind of stuff when you're supposed to do this and when you're not. Here is a section of the Avadazara 3.7, and this is a section they're talking about Asherah trees. He says, what is an Asherah? Every tree that has idolatry below it. So it doesn't matter how it's done. If the tree has an idol under it, it's an Asherah tree or an idol tree. Okay. Uh, and it's also every tree that's worshipped if they've worshipped the trees. But again, you don't cut the forest down. If they just worship spirits and they don't bother God's creation, you don't destroy God's creation. Okay. So it's the same thing. If somebody started worshipping uh, hamburgers, I'm not going to stop eating hamburgers. If I, if I know they do it in a certain ritual way, I will eat it backwards. I will do something totally different so everybody can see I'm not one of them. But I'm not giving up my hamburgers. They're God-given food. I like them. I'm gonna, I was here first. You know? And if we think of it that way, God, Adam, Noah, uh, we were all here first. Pagans are the ones that get confused and worship rocks and things like that. So... I'm not going to get rid of all the rocks in my rock garden because someone else 
you know, made a Zen garden out of theirs. Well, that's their stuff. But I'm going to do it in such a way as everybody can tell it's artistic, but it's got nothing to do with the paganism. So it goes on and says it happened in Zidon regarding a tree that was worshipped. Uh, and they found below it a pile of stones. So Rabbi Shimon said to them, examine the pile. And because there was an image that was worshipped under the pile of stones, we shall permit the tree for them. And they destroyed the image but left off the tree. So the concept is the same. It's just a tree. And it was a spot that they had marked. And under the pile of stones, there was an idol. So we take the stones away. We destroy the idol. The tree is a tree. We just leave it alone because it's something God created. They give other examples. For instance, there's a um, Merculus, I think it's called. Uh, it's a kind of a statue that was dedicated to the god of Mars. Not the god of Mars, the god Mars, the god of war. Um, and so the idea was you had this big pillar in the center and these two other pillars at the side. And the way you worshipped the god of Mars was when you come up to one of those statues, you'd take a rock and you throw it at it. You're showing how good at war you are, how much you worship the god of, of war. And hopefully you hit the center one every time. But it just shows how good you are, how dedicated you are to that god. So when you find something like that, you do not throw stones because somebody might think you're participating in paganism. Now, if you went to any other idol, any other temple, and you picked up a rock and you threw it at, say, like a Buddha statue, they would consider that sacrilege. Okay? So it's like when you walk into a Buddhist temple, you have to maybe say you bow three times or whatever. Well, I'm not going to try to go in there anyway, and I'm definitely not bowing. I do not worship that god or goddess or whatever. And so that's the concept that they're giving. They gave lots of other examples. But I thought that was a really cool example. Um, if I throw a rock at an idol, everybody will get mad at me because I'm doing sacrilege, except for this one. Okay, so the concept is to learn what they did and not pattern yourself after them. But make sure that you don't give up your trees, your food, your other things because somebody took it and made it pagan and nothing is pagan in and of itself everything was originally created by god it's either godly or it's secular okay so the fact that somebody mixed it up and made it pagan is kind of irrelevant now if you're a missionary and you're in certain areas you probably have to limit what you're doing in certain things much more than other people and it all depends on the culture and those kind of things but what we want to make sure that people understand is this whole concept of nullification. Okay, so if I buy a house and I find an idol in it made of gold, I grind it up so nobody could do it, I melt it down, and then I'm going to, you know, take it to the bank. It's my property, I'm going to use it, but it's, and that's a, that's a Gentile form of nullification. Uh, according to the rabbis, I can do that they would have to grind it to powder and send it off and, you know, completely destroy it. That to me seems like a waste. Uh, but anyway, you've heard of people maybe taking um, an ancient board that, you know, used to be used in some temple and thinking, this is nice and flat, I'll make a kitchen table out of it. Well, they just nullified it because they've taken something that was sacred to that group and made it secular. So when you make something secular, it, it becomes that way. So here's an interesting idea, the concept of a Christmas tree. Let's say it is religious. It's Christian. You know, it's a religious symbol. It's used by Christians. Today, you probably find a Christmas tree in almost every home across the nation. And most of the, there's actually a handful of houses where the kids in there have never heard about Jesus. But they all know that they get presents on Christmas. And to them, that's all it is. So it's been really nullified in a bad sense. There's no religious at all. It's completely secular. So we need to make sure that we put Christ back in Christmas and witness in Christmas and things like that. So those are just a couple of examples. But I thought it was interesting to look at that Avadazara and look at some of the examples they give. And so they clearly say that if you're Jewish, for instance, and you go into a, a Gentile city and they got a big statue of a king, 
but it's not worshipped. It's not an idol, so don't worry about it. But if it's a big city and it's a statue of a god that they worship and they pray to it, even if they're not praying to it at that point, you, you don't want to go in the city. You just want to shake the dust off your feet and go away. So again, bringing it all back to 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 33, the whole concept back here is do not participate in pagan rites. So don't go into a temple. Don't fellowship with them when they're doing some sort of demonic thing. Leave them alone. If you're wanting to try to go to someone's house to witness, you can sit down and eat with them. It doesn't matter. He might have little statues of whatever in his house, but it's not the ones that they use in, in, uh, in, in the ritual. So they're not idols. They're just stupid decoration, basically. So if he gives them to you, you can smash them. But you don't steal property and destroy it. So that's one of those things that we have to think about. But then he gets to this part saying, everything's lawful. I can eat anything. It doesn't really matter. And I'm not going to give credibility to the false god by not eating something somebody may have touched. It's like I don't care. He's nothing to me. And I'll eat it in such a way as that he would he would not like. You have to eat it with your right hand. Great, I'll eat it with my left hand then. You have to recite a prayer. I won't say nothing. I'll just eat my sandwich. I'm not a worshiper of that. And I want to make sure people know I don't I don't dress like it. And that's one of the things as a missionary, you got to find out how the people dress. And don't dress like witch doctors. Don't dress like prostitutes. Don't dress like, you know, those kind of people. And it might be different in every situation. So wherever you're ministering, you have to find out all that stuff, tailor your life to be the best witness you can for the Lord. So whatever sold, sold in the shambles, you can eat it. It's not a big deal. And if you eat it and witness to the person, it's good. The only caveat is if you have a um, weak brethren, somebody that doesn't understand it, thinks you might die because you've eaten uh, a sandwich that was dedicated to a demon and the demon might get you. It's like, that's not how it works, but we don't do it in front of someone. We talk to them. I have Hebrew roots friends, for instance, um, and I explain to them that the basic understanding is that Gentiles don't eat kosher, for instance. Deuteronomy 14.21 would say, would, you know, is, is one real easy verse for something like that. And they think I'm weird, but I, I tell them right up front, I understand that you do. I don't think you need to, but you've told me that you do. You're a brother. I love you. So if you come to my house, I will make darn sure that if I give you anything, it will not have any MSG in it. No pork. So no Doritos for you. Nothing that might have anything to do with an unkosher food. You know, you know, that kind of a thing, because I love now. But I want to be honest with you as a brother. As soon as you leave, I'm going to go eat a bacon cheeseburger. You have to know that I'm not following that because I'm Gentile. But I care about you in the Lord. So if you want to, I would love to sit down and talk with you and th show you the scriptures where we're getting this. And then you decide for yourself. But know that I'm not going to cuss you out. I'm not going to turn you away. Uh, you're a brother in the Lord. It, I, it's just that Paul would classify you as a weak brethren, and I would really like to make you a mature brother. So whenever we can, you know, we can do this. So this is that whole concept. So don't give any offense to Jews, Gentiles, or the church of God. So be careful in all those kinds of things. So at this point, I'll go ahead and stop for tonight's teaching. It's kind of short. It's only 40 minutes. But uh, we'll go into the chat room and see if there's any questions. Let's see, sinking down in my chair again. Uh, Hal says, "Yeah, thank you for, yeah, giving the opportunity to reason over the scriptures. Yeah, and that's the main thing. You might totally disagree with what I just said, and that's okay." As long as we don't divide over it, you know, if it's that important, it should be clear and we should be able to come together on it. 
Um, let's see here. Lots of people saying hello. Yeah, there we go. Um, my wife said the 1708 dictionary says shambles. A shambles is a place where butchers sell meat. So, yeah, and that concept was they're in a pagan city, so almost all the butchers, at least until some of the people get converted, almost all the people in the area are pagan. So pagans are getting meat from probably their temples. Maybe not. Maybe some of it's just meat that they got elsewhere, but you don't know. So Paul is saying, don't ask. And again, the whole concept is, if I ask, they're going to say, why? Are you a worshiper of that God or some other God? You know, and that might be a good thing to say to get, you know, the ability to witness. You just have to play it by ear. But if you think it's going to be one of these problems, just come in and say, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a guy and we're friends, you know, develop a friendship with them. And then it's like, hey, you worship Zeus or Hera? Neither one. I worship Jesus Christ. Oh, you're one of those? Yeah. You want to hear about it? Well, I heard they're weird. Nah. Do you think I'm weird? No, you're a good guy. Well, let me talk to you about it. And so to witness, but we also want to be very careful not to offend new believers. That puts us in a very difficult position. Or did them back then at that time. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, before my parents were saved, they had some kachinas. I'm not sure what those are. Anyway, and other native souvenirs around the house. I didn't feel good about it, but but would they have been nullified because I was a believer? Well, if they are objects specifically created for paganism or for... Um, um, you know, like a demonic ritual or something, then if, if they belong to you, you should get rid of them, destroy them. Now, if they belong to your parents and you're living with your parents, for instance, it's your parents' property. So you might try to talk to them, if they're Christian, for instance, talk to them about this and see if you can get them to get rid of their, their stuff. Uh, if they don't, they don't. Because the number one thing is you don't steal. And number two, you don't destroy somebody else's property. You know, so be very clear about that. But yeah, um, so a, an example of that, for instance, is those uh, dream catchers, talking about Native American type stuff. The dream catchers, you know, with the web and the concept is, you know, we were always told it's a cute little story for kids. It catches the bad dreams and lets the good ones through. Well, if that's all it is, it's a kid's story, so it's not a big deal. But if you go back and you look, some of the Native American uh, witch doctors, that kind of stuff, uh, use it as an occult object. So if they currently believe that it does something and use it as an occult object, then we shouldn't have it. So I would go ahead and destroy it. So if it's a tomahawk or something, you know, some sort of native thing that means, you know, you're a king or it's a, you know, a piece of antiquity or something, keep it definitely. But if it has something to do with false religions, we want to get rid of it. And that's for our witness. Um, I was talking with a guy who was a missionary to, I believe, the Lakota tribe. And he was, they had a problem because they had a group of, I don't remember which denomination was, but a group of people came in to give Bibles and uh, medicine and stuff like that to them and try to convert them with them. And uh, they, they thought it was cool, so they were buying little souvenirs and stuff, and that's fine. But several of them bought the dream catchers, not knowing what it is, you know, and put them up. And so then you've got some people that have occult problems, thinking Christians might be able to help. They go to the missionaries, and the missionaries, they have dream catchers up. Oh, you need those things too? You must not be that powerful. Okay, I'll shut up and go away then. And so it was causing problems. 
you know, they want out of this demonic thing. And if you have to put those up to protect yourself from the demons, you don't have the power to help me. And that's logical. But the Christians didn't know that that's what some people thought those meant. And so that's the whole thing about being all things to all people. If there's any possibility it could be demonic or somebody could think it's demonic, then it would be a bad witness. So you got to be real careful of that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's that's the basic concept. So the idols and stuff go. But for instance, if 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 that's an idol or a demonic type thing, we'd get rid of that. But there's no reason to get rid of anything else, like the tools that made it or the shop it was housed in or things like that. That's where you would draw the line with that kind of thing. That's a good good point. I had one, uh, I think it was my wife's father. She was telling me the story about how he, and he was a Nazarene, but he went to a thrift shop or something, and somebody had a, a really big Ouija board. But it was like 50 cents because it was just a piece of junk. And he's like, I could take that, sand it down, and re re-shellac it, make a really great tabletop out of it. And that's what he did, if I remember the story right. And it turned out to be a fairly good, it was an unusually thick piece of wood. You know, he could care less that it's a Ouija board. He's not going to use it as a Ouija board. It, it's meaningless to him. And he nullified it by turn, turning it into a table. It can't be used as a Ouija board anymore. But there's no reason to destroy the wood. I mean, the wood didn't become evil or become demon possessed because of what was used. And if it did somehow, you know, have some sort of connection with the occult, you brought it into a Christian home, I don't think you're going to have any problems with it. So changing it around, that kind of stuff. Now, if you do, you do. If you have some sort of demonic problem, then you fix it. That's, you know, a somewhat different story. Um, let's see here. Next question. What should we do if we're invited to a meal and the host begins a non-Christian prayer? Thanks for food. I couldn't, well, you couldn't participate. I, I guess what you could do is stand up and back off at least. You know, and, it, it, you know, try to be as non-rude as possible, but make sure that they know you're not compromising. You know, so I, I go to supper with you and all of a sudden you start saying, um, hail Zeus, king of the whatever, we dedicate this meal to thee, and blah, blah, blah. I, I would just stand up and back away. I probably would even stay in the room. I would just back up to a corner. That might, you know, I don't know, because I don't want to give the impression that I know about Zeus, and I'm scared because he might zap me. But, you know, I, I would, they would probably look at me strange, and then afterwards I would say, I did not mean any disrespect to you as a friend. But as a Christian, I consider that demonic or a false god, and I cannot participate in it. Uh, would you like me, I hope that doesn't wreck our friendship, but would you like me to leave? Or do, would you like me to stay? Or, you know, that that's probably enough at that point. He'd be like, you can't even, oh, okay, that's weird. But that's a start in a witness. And if he asks you to stay, uh, the food is just food. So he might come up later on in the conversation so why is it christians can't pray to zeus well it's not zeus in particular we believe that there's one true god and anybody else out there it's just either made up stories or it's demonic that's what our sacred texts say it's not my opinion you know i'm not trying to be divisive but that's what our texts say oh that's weird you know and then you get thinking about it and then hopefully he says, well, that one time we did pray to Zeus and that weird thing happened. Maybe there's something to that. So if he's pleased to be your friend, you want to be his friend as best as you can and say, I can't do this because of my religion or whatever. And just like if you came to me and said, you're Hebrew roots, um, does this have bacon in it? You know, it's like, I didn't know you were Hebrew roots. Let's take this away. I'll get you something else. Not a problem. Because you're not trying to be finicky, you're trying to serve God. I disagree with what you're doing, but it's not a big deal. I'll get you something else, you know, something that's that'll work. Uh, so that's probably what I would do. I don't think any of I, I used to think that none of us would ever be in this situation because all the Greek gods are gone and all this other kind of stuff. 
But now in the United States, we have an influx of uh, Islam and a few other little religions. So you get like in some place that's ecumenical. That's why a lot of the churches, like a lot of the Calvary chapels, back away from ecumenical type services. I mean, it's fine for you to be Presbyterian, Methodist, some Christian denomination. That's just a denomination inside of the same religion. So we're all Christians. But if it's a Muslim praying to Allah, I, I probably would not participate. I would try to be nice because I would like to get him saved if possible. But that's a great time to witness. You know, we can't do this. Good questions. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's in the middle of a conversation, but I think that we wouldn't eat, wouldn't be in a position rather to eat food sacrificed to idols. See, this is a great example. If you could do it in such a way as you make it secular, almost to try to offend them, being nice, but it's like this is the sacred meat of whatever. It cannot be touched with the fingers. It has to be by a fork. Okay, well then let me have it so I can eat it. You know, it's like it can't be, you have to use your hands. It can't touch metal. Great, get me a fork. So it, you, you don't want to be divisive per se, but you want to make sure people understand it. A long time ago, I had a, a beard that I let grow. I don't know if you, some of you probably remember. And it got, you know, like down to here or so. It was a pretty good sized beard. And one of the guys uh, online said, keep, keep doing the mikvah. And I realized he thought I was growing the beard because I was Hebrew roots or Messianic or whatever. And I, I want to make sure people understand that I'm not Jewish if I'm not Jewish. You know, uh, it's it's part of being above board and completely honest. It's like, I thought you uh, you were sacred name or something. It's like, no, you saw me eating a bacon cheeseburger the other day. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, you're not. You're not. No. Well, why the beard? I like beards. You know, that kind of thing. So you need to be really careful. I always joke around. We have a guy, the the drummer in our church, uh, Jeff, he's bald. And I always joke around. It's like, be very careful if you go to a, go to a um, airport, don't dress all in orange. You know, just a joke. Harry Krishna's, the bald-headed people all dressed in orange. And so that that's an example. It's like, if that happened to be his favorite color and he dressed that way all the time, well, the fact that he's bald, he can't do anything about that. But because we have that, don't dress in orange. It would almost be sinful for him if you think about it. I think it's a great example. I could probably dress in orange because I've got hair and I've got a beard. I'm really fuzzy. You know, I don't know. But it's just you want to make sure people understand, no, he's not one of them. That's like the Nazarite vow anciently uh you let your hair grow really long they had the worshipers of baal back at that time and they were the same way they had bald head they'd shave their heads so if i have this massive head of hair goes all the way down my back then that in itself will let you know i haven't been a worshiper or priest of baal in what how many years how long does it take to get hair to grow that long it's been years at least i probably have never been a worshiper of Baal so it's a good witness but then you get like hippies and people that are new agers if they all of a sudden grow really long hair then maybe we should have short hair just to show who we are so that kind of a thing ah oh, the grove kind of looks like the a canopy in the Vatican yeah, they do a lot of interesting things like that. Yeah, I would be really careful to do something like that. And again, if we have, like this is our tree, um, if this is what it looked like, most people would never recognize this. So it's probably not even an issue today. But if I had some, if I had trees that were close enough that grew together like that, and somebody would could possibly go, wow, this looks like the Asherah tree down the street with those with that weird cult. OK, 
okay, the trees are going to be pruned tomorrow. And if I can't get to it, I might cut them down. The trees are okay because I don't worship Asherah, but I don't want to look like it. Don't want to confuse people. I want everybody to know, no, that guy is a Christian. Well, I thought he had to. Yeah, he cut him down. Well, he used to have a really long beard. Yeah, he realized what that meant and he cut his beard off. So you want to you want to try to do everything to appear to be Christian, not in a fake way, but make sure there's no confusion. So, but at the same same time goes is the other way too. If we have sacred name people that use the name Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever all the time, I want to make sure they understand that I'm not that. So I'm going to use the name God and Lord and Jesus Christ. Um, if people think Christmas trees are pagan, um, and you you need to decide for yourself what you want to do with that. But sometimes it's good for like I do a lot of scroll studies. So it's really good for my Hebrew roots friends to come over to know that I'm going not to serve them any bacon, but if they come to my house, know there's a Christmas tree in the corner. Just to reinforce the idea that I'm not one of you. We all study the scrolls. So maybe we should think about that. Why would I be different studying the same thing you do? How did I get a different frame of reference? Well, there's these other scrolls, for instance, the Avadozara. Why don't you read them? You know, it's a good witnessing technique. And if you reject it, you reject it. I'm not going to, you know, have a problem with it. The only problem I have is if you're a Hebrew roots per or whoever, and you come here and you start arguing, like somebody in the chat room trying to cause problems, they get bumped off, not because they're even necessarily wrong in what they said, but that they're causing problems. That's the main thing we have to be careful of. Another place where Paul's talking about that, about weak believers, he says, don't forbid them to come to your assembly, uh, but just make sure that they come not to dispute. So the troublemakers have to leave for no matter what their doctrine is. The people that are honestly trying to figure it out, no matter what their doctrine is, need to come, we'll discuss it, and I'll explain the scriptures to you. And that's what we need to do. Try to do it as friendly as, as we can. But we do have to stand for truth. There's no abortion. There's no fornication of any kind, no homosexuality. Those are all forbidden things in Scripture. So as a Christian, I'm not going to participate in those things. So you have to understand that if you come here and you talk about how cool those things are, that's causing a problem. So we'd probably ask you to leave. So you need to understand the basics of Christianity so that you don't offend Christians or Gentiles or Jews. Oh, somebody was saying they had problems with YouTube. Yeah, just restart YouTube is the best thing to do that. We're working on um, getting other platforms going, like Rumble and uh, Subsplash. Waiting on Gab to get live streaming, just to kind of pull it all together. So I'll have some things probably next week to show you guys. And um, at last Monday, I think we talked a little bit about the calendar. So I've been working on that too. I've got one that's not quite, I think it's almost up and operational. Let me just show it to you real quick. This is the uh, the new Dead Sea Scroll calendar page. And I'll explain it later. We'll have videos and stuff like that. But basically, this is the new year. This is, or the Tech Kufa. This is the new year. So this goes all the way around here and you count these. So like this is Tammuz. This is the 27th, I think it is. Oh yeah, here it is. 27th of Tammuz right here. So this is this one. Tomorrow it'll be the 28th. So this particular one will go. So you can see this is a counter. It goes from out to in. This is the Lord's Day and this is the Sabbath. So you have the weeks going that way. And then as you go through in all of these, these lighter colored places are the holidays. Like this is Passover week and Unleavened Bread. So you can in one, one thing see all of time. But if you go through this every year, these are the year pointers. 
So there's a Shemitah, seven years, another Shemitah, till you got 49 of them, and then there's a Jubilee. And then each Jubilee is a tick, and 50 of those is an Una. And so you start here, and by the time we get done with all of the Unas, it's the end of the millennial reign. So this is a 7,000-year clock. So, And we've got the Gregorian stuff down here and the uh, Dead Sea Scroll stuff up here. This is a test. You can ignore that. That shouldn't be there. But uh, the ages, the onas, the jubilees, the shemitas, and the years. So we'll have good discussions on this. But basically, as you can see here, starting here, we're in the 12th ona, the next to the last jubilee. So it's the 12th ona and the ninth jubilee. And then in that jubilee, starting here, going to here, we're in the last shemitah, which would be the seventh shemitah. And we're in year four. So year four. And so this is the way they did it. They just had these ticks and on their wheels. So it's pretty interesting. We'll uh, delve into that sometime too. But the the onas, the jubilees, the years and shemitahs in a jubilee, and then the days in a year is their calendar. And their calendars were always round. So it'll be interesting to come back to that. What I would like to do, this is like um, the beginning part. So this would be one thing. And down further down, we could add um, the same thing we have like in here. Um, our, oh. oh, weird. Anyway, um, the uh, master timeline. Remember this one? Age of creation, Torah, grace. These are the onas. And then for each one of these onas, we've got, it's a 500-year period. We have all the things in here. So I'd like to incorporate this all in the calendar. So you can look at that and see all of time, pick the onas, and then look at all these things. So it would have the AM date, the BC date, the Shemitahs, and the Jubilees. And then you would know what ona you're in. So it'll be really interesting. It seems complicated. But I'm just trying to, and it's not super necessary, but I'm trying to bring back the way they did things, understand their calendar completely, plug it in with the Bible so we can see patterns and things like that. So we'll get there. Okay, here's what I think is a question. Um, yeah, good evening. What uh, what we eat and drink do not corrupt. So are you planning to look into the spiritual effects of ancient law? Have you made progress into the Psalms of uh, progression? Uh, not a whole lot in that. I'm still waiting for, well, basically I'm kind of stuck on the Psalms because uh, the way Nathan said, I need the titles for the Psalms. And I firmly believe they're somewhere. It's just that most of the Psalms that we have in our Bibles don't have titles. Some do, some don't. So I'm working on that. And you're, you're right. What you eat and drink doesn't corrupt you. It's, Jesus said it's not what goes in the mouth. It's what comes out of the heart. And I've heard Hebrew roots people say he's talking to Jews and Jews would have known better. And yes, but he's talking to the crowd. So that's Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes. And it's also Roman centurions. So as a Roman standing there eating pork and everything else, he's talking to all of them, saying it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles, it's what comes out of the heart. You know, because he talked later on, he mentions if you're a soldier, do this, don't do that. So we have to understand that. So Jesus meant exactly what he said, like it says in the TR version of, I forget where, but when he's talking about that, he says, um, it's what comes out of the heart, not what goes in the mouth. Thus, he declared for all foods clean. So going back to Genesis um, chapter 8. So good questions or good comments. Okay, talking about earthquakes and things. Okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, good point. We definitely do not want to be superstitious. Um, and, and that comes, again, that a, that's a, would be a weak brethren. When you become a Christian and you realize there really are things like demons, and there really are things like occult objects, and th those are things that we shouldn't be playing around with, especially your other family members that may not be Christian, they could get into a lot of trouble with that. But we need to understand the concept of nullification for rituals and um, the demonic stuff. The church fathers talk about the fact that once you become a Christian, you're infilled with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to worry about demons anymore. They had, <clears throat> they were in the midst of all that, and they had the opposite problem, as you might think. Uh, they had to be careful of, of pagan crowds. Because what would happen is they would walk by a temple or go in somewhere where somebody's doing a ritual somewhere in the building or whatever. And the reports would say the rituals all of a sudden would stop working. And it got to the point, it's like the ritual's not working again. There must be a Christian around here. And they began to hate the Christians for that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of early church father reports about that. And so you don't have to worry about the demons, but you have to worry about creating a mob because you're a Christian. You can't help it. The Holy Spirit's in you. So you walk in the door, things are going to happen. You know, and so it's interesting. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about superstition or anything like that. But we do need to use all this stuff to witness to people. So that's a good, really good point. Okay, just looking to see if there's any more questions. Oh, Cheryl likes it. Yeah, the circular calendar. Yep, it's actually uh, operational now. I, I put stuff in just to kind of uh, show things where to go. But this is all operational. It pulls, like when you go here to look, uh, today is the, like right now where I'm at, it's the 12th of July. It's 8 8 8.08 p.m., um, things like that. I'm in a certain time zone. So it'll take all that from my browser and convert it to Jerusalem time. And then that date on Jerusalem time and build it. So as you can see right now, I've got, and I might be off on this. That's why it's not finished, but it should be four in the morning, Israeli standard time. It should already be July 12th. Well, let me refresh this. Maybe I, okay. I thought that was weird. Okay, so I had that up from this morning. So it's already 3 in the morning, and it's July 13th, 2021. So it's Tammuz 28. As you can see, this moved down. It was here, so it's moved down to the 28th, 29 and 30. And then we start um, the Thursday, or that'd be Friday, you know, the Friday um, first day of Av. Remember, the third day of Av, which is a Sunday, is the festival of new wine so that's coming up to sunday um okay so yeah it'll be interesting so all this stuff should and all this should change too like next year this should be uh year five six seven and then this will change and then we have a, a new jubilee so it's all automated and hopefully works correctly Okay, good. See, this this is the kind of thing we're, we're worrying about. Um, she says, thank you. I will put up my Christmas tree this year. Someone had convinced me that it was a sin, so I had to stop it. I threw it away. So many beautiful, pricey ornaments. I feel stupid now, and I regret it. Actually, think about that for a minute. You weren't sure somebody th made you think it probably was sinful, and you got rid of it because you love the Lord. Isn't that cool? If you think about it, yeah, it's a waste of money, but 
you did something that you didn't really want to do because you thought it was the Lord's will. That shows how dedicated you are to the Lord. So that's that's amazing if you think about it that way. But yeah, it's the Christmas trees have nothing to do with um, Jeremiah and or Shara trees or whatever. And so it was funny because I remember being in college asking my professors about this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, we really don't know. But the Alpha de Zara has been around forever. It's like, why didn't you know about it? So, But anyway, I guess nobody can know everything. But it, it bothers me because I've had two friends that actually went to seminary, one a Baptist and one a Nazarene, and started looking at the Hebrew root stuff and went up to their professors and said, since we have the Ten Commandments, why don't we observe the Sabbath anymore? And the only answers they got, it's a really easy answer, and there's a specific reason, but the, the only answers they got in seminary was, well, it's just what we do. Well, yeah, it's what we do, but it might be sin. You know, why do we do what we do? Was it commanded? Did somebody just up and decide it? What was the, what's the history behind it? Well, nobody remembers. Well, that's a really bad place to be. You know, if it might be a sin, and we're all doing it and nobody knows for sure maybe we should stop until we find out i mean that's that's just a logical thing uh, and it, they they could have explained it to them it, you know but the professors didn't really know the history or didn't want to get into it and it really bothers me it's just like in a seminary there should have been somebody that would be able to sit down and explain that real easy let me show you these two scriptures and we'll talk about it you know that kind of thing so I'm, I'm glad you did that don't feel bad feel kind of proud that just to be on the safe side you don't want to upset God not that he's going to punish you or anything but you love him you want him to be pleased and if he doesn't want you to have that you got rid of it I'm, I'm kind of proud of you for doing that that's cool uh, but now you know better so now you can it but you don't have to so if you have kids and you want to fit in with this culture it might be a wise thing but whatever you do, use Christmas to witness. You know, a lot of people, you say, you know, Jesus loves you. Ah, you weirdo. But at Christmas time, you can always say, Jesus loves you. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Everybody's like that. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people. So we need to use what we can to witness and not throw away things God's given us. Ah, I'm not exactly sure. Well, well, let me answer this. Speaking of calendars, uh, what is special about the number 22? I posted on your Gab page today about the lyri about the lyres, rather, uh, and noticed 22 strings and 22 almond cups on the lampstand and the menorah. All I know for sure is from the writings of like Josephus, and there's Someone sent me a reference from the Talmud, too, that talks about that. The lampstand was used to, uh, to calculate the calendar. And so the ornament, it's described in the, in the Old Testament that it's got so many almonds, so many flowers, so many knots. They're in this order with two and then three and then. So obviously it's some way of keeping a calendar. Much like over here, we could say, um, where did it go? My, not my tree, this one. So it's just like, you know, you could ask, like, for instance, here, why are there 49 of these and then a circle thing? And I did that, too. It's like, I have no idea. Well, it's 50, but or maybe it's 51 because maybe these are two halves. You know, maybe who knows, you know, but then you start looking at this and figuring out. But the menorah is something similar. You're going to have certain knobs and stuff, which if you counted a certain way, there's, there's so many, and then every set of 22 would do something. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not sure what they counted. We just know that they did, uh, according to what has been told. And it's interesting. We're finding more and more little comments about, uh, like the thing from the Talmud the guy sent me the other day. It said, um, um, made it just a real brief comment that the, the, uh, the, um, the boards on the floor and on the walls uh, were used as a calendar. Didn't say how. 
and we can go back to the tabernacle in the Old Testament and you can look and you make a little model there's models you can get too but you can make one or a drawing and you can count or it'll even count for you there's so many on one side so many on the other so many on the front and back so many on the board it's covered with three separate skins that are these colors and so there there's a reason for it and so we're told by that comment that it like the menorah like the temple like the uh, gilgals were types of calendars they're used for lots of things but the buildings were designed in such a way as you would keep time so nothing occultic about it especially the jerusalem temple god designed the sun moon and the stars and told them to follow the directions that's why we do a sabbath we do sets of sevens or you know seven days a week you may or may not observe the sabbath as the jews do but we all have a seven day week and it's important for us to use that for the calendar no so i'm not sure exactly but i know it means something and it would it would we might be able to figure it out if we just pulled it all together like this calendar stuff we know the menorah has got something to do with it so pull the menorah in and then get a model of the tabernacle and then kind of see how the patterns would work it would have to be something with sets of 30 uh sets of 50 um sets of seven things like that and somehow they would you know there'd be so many in each kind so that would be really fantastic to do i would love to do that get a model of the the tabernacle and the menorah to go along with those things see this is cool we're all pulling things together in the form of comments or questions and it's all leading us all as, as a, a whole down a certain road so this is really neat yeah, South Africa is having lots of problems. We need to pray for the South Africans. Yeah, and that's one of the things where we're not trying to make controversy but we do want to teach the truth if we're not supposed to have one let's not have one i really don't care but let's do what the lord wants but if we don't have to have one then you know you could choose whatever works best for you and your first thought is well if we all just if it's not something god commanded if we all got rid of them then we'd be able to all fellowship together and that sounds logical that's the error in galatians if you think about it the whole concept was um, the Jews and the Gentiles became Christians they all had the common meals together Peter participated so they all ate non-kosher food and that whole concept was when the people from James Church came down Peter separated himself so it would look like the regular synagogues now the logic behind it sounds good it's like well they're only going to be here two days let's not start a big old argument uh we're all brothers in the lord it doesn't really matter so if i take them over there and eat with them and we do the regular washings again and we don't have any gentiles come by we won't have a problem they can go back and everything will be fine it sounds good why cause a problem when you don't have to you know but paul stepped in and says you're being a being a um, not a heretic you're being a hypocrite you know what to do next time somebody comes and says i don't want you to pray in the name of jesus it's going to be a little there's people that don't like that well i'm sorry that's what christians do well then we're going to excommunicate you then excommunicate me uh, i'm not trying to make a big deal out of it but you need to understand people christians pray in the name of jesus or yeshua or whatever but i mean we don't tell us not to pray you know it's that kind of a thing and so it's an excellent excellent point in galatians we think it says even barnabas uh, fell away from in, in the problem it's not because they were trying to sin they were thinking well okay if we bring it up we'll cause this fight and some of the younger ones might get depressed and go away and it, it might cause a problem we don't want anybody to to walk away and not get saved so yeah let's kind of keep it under wraps paul's like no that's not the way that it works 
if they see you pulling away from them to follow what these guys, they're going to think that secretly, I mean, technically, this is right, and you know better, and you're sinning and they're sinning. That's going to make them fall away. So the little ones are the ones we always want to think about, the new believers. Make sure they don't fall into any kind of this weird stuff. That's the important part. If we can fall into it, they can for sure. So we got to be real careful. So that will happen, and we need to be ready. So just understand that kind of stuff. Oh, comment. I love the new calendar. It reminds me of how the ancient Mayans and Aztecs depicted them. Yeah, isn't it interesting? Yeah, now see, this is going to get me in trouble. I know this is going to get me in trouble. It looks too pagan, doesn't it? I'm going to get in trouble. So, like, for instance, uh, the main idea, or one of the things here, since they all start with the Takufas, and the very next day is the first. So the Takufas are the solstices and equinoxes because it's supposed to be a solar calendar. So here's the this spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, winter solstice, and then back again. So just to balance it out, here are the mid-seasonal points. That's what these are. And when I started doing that, it's, you just learned, this is the 17th of the second month. It's always the 17th of the following month. The way this calendar works, it's the same every year. But do you remember, you guys remember what Genesis said happened on the 17th of the second month? It's the flood. So 1656 ER 17 it was the date of the flood, according to the calendar. So it's, it's interesting. But I remember going to a church that they said, if there's anybody doing anything with solstices and equinoxes, that's just pure witchcraft. They're, they're a cult. They're fake Christians. Leave them alone. They're going to go to hell. You know. And I'm sitting there thinking like, so if I have anything to do with any calendar, all our calendars are based on that. Gregorian, the, sun, the spring equinox is always on March 20th. And in the Jewish calendar, it's within a month, but it always comes back around again. Because you got to keep the seasons. you got to plant. You can't plant in winter. You've got to know the small window that you have to plant and whatever you're hunting, the small window when they're not having young and you can hunt them not to extinction, you have to know the basic solar calendar or you can't live on Earth. So, but it's interesting. So I, I'll probably get in trouble on this. It's like solstices, equinoxes, it's round. It's obviously the occult, but that's okay. I don't care. Uh, again, I, I, that's why I preface this. I want to have anything to do with the occult. If it's an occult object, we'll destroy it. This is a Dead Sea Scroll sundial, and this is the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. They tell a story that may or may not be correct, but it is their story. And I would like to let make sure we all know about it. So, very interesting. But yeah, that's that just goes to show you that when you go way, way back to the ancients, they kind of sort of all had the same kind of calendar. Almost everybody way back had a seven day cycle, you know, and then later on, some of them changed it to five and, you know, they had dip weird types of weeks and, and leap days and leap months and leap partial weeks and stuff like that. Almost everybody had the same kind of thing, though. Is it ever acceptable to swear while witnessing? I don't think so. I mean, we do. You might catch me stubbing my toe or, or something happening and I say something I shouldn't. The sin nature popping out. Um, haven't become perfect yet. Uh, I need to work on that. I don't, that doesn't happen very often. But I, that was, I was explaining that to someone else. You might catch me doing that, but you will never ever catch me deliberately swearing or cursing um, from a pulpit. Unless you're talking about, yeah, you, know, you may be talking about like an oath. Say I'm talking to someone that has a works-based idea or another Jesus or a friend that's just angry and blame gods for past religious experiences. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Um, it doesn't seem to... Um, it's probably not a good idea. 
um, along those same lines, I um, was uh, teaching a Bible study a couple of towns over a long time ago, about 20 some years back. And this lady invited her brother, but her brother was a drunk. And he came three or four times to the Bible study every single time. He wasn't a, a whole lot of a problem. He was quiet most of the time. But you could tell he was completely drunk every time. So I finally told her that we can't have him coming you know, as a drunk. And the logic, one of those, again, twisted logics behind it, she said, well, we might be the only Christians he ever sees. We need to be friends with him so that he might become a Christian. And I said, yes, but we also have to obey scripture. None of our group can be drunk all the time or walking in fornication or practicing witchcraft or anything. You can't have that here. Not that that would bother us per se, like demons would get us or anything, but it's forbidden. So he cannot come to Bible study. If he wants to talk about it, I'll be glad to come and talk with him. But we have to... And she got mad because she thought that was, but he might go to hell. Well, he might, but that is not my concern. My concern is to follow what God told me to do, you know, and then try my best. If if we try our best, he's not going to get too too angry with us. Like, well, we can't let you come because it's forbidden in Scripture. Well, that's weird. Yeah, maybe it is, but that's what it is. I've had people get mad at me that way before. And, and if they get really mad at me and say I'm judging them or something, I'll try to stop them and say, no, no, you do whatever you do. I should have the right to live my life my way. And they almost always stop and say, well, yeah. It's like, yeah, well, I want to follow scripture. That's all. I could care less one way or the other. But scripture says, don't associate with people that claim to be Christian that do one, two, three, four, five. So... Maybe I'm misinterpreting it, whatever. We can think about that. But in the meantime, to me, it looks like you're sinning. So I don't want to fellowship with you. I'd like to, but I want to follow scripture. And you're trying to tell me that I can't follow, uh, I can't live my life my way. You know, and every time I've done that, it's it's completely flipped. They're like, well, I think you're wrong and I think you're taking it too far. But no, you. I'm definitely behind you living your life your way and my life my way like well but if our lifestyles are different we can't fellowship and i've had several people that have uh, calmed down and thought about it after a while because i said that's the last thing anybody wants to do in this society is is tell somebody they can't live a lifestyle that because it we're all about i get to do whatever i want type thing so i think that's possibly a good way to start witnessing to people no, you will do, not, not that you can or it's an okay thing. You will do what you want. I understand that. I'm going to do what I want. All I want to do is follow scripture. If you want to study with me, that's fine. But here's the commands in scripture. You're going to have to follow these directions. Will you go to hell if you don't? Don't know. That's not the issue. I'm just wanting to follow this. So if you want to fellowship with me, let's follow this. Or at least let's talk about it. But don't get mad because we'll never get anywhere that way. Think about it. Why did it say that? Maybe this word doesn't mean that. Maybe I am off. Why don't you learn a little bit of Greek and Hebrew? Study with some people. Find out for yourself what you think the scripture says. Just do that. Go study. And then come back and tell me. So good, good ways to do in that. So yeah, I don't think we should allow a drunk to come. I don't think we should, because those are all considered sin. So I don't think there's ever a time we should be doing something like that. I don't think it makes a difference. The question is, is it better to pray in proximity? rather than from a distance if we suspect a demonic influence? Um, I guess yes and no. On a physical level, they can't hit you if you're further away from them that they can hit, uh, if they go nuts and just try to attack you or something. And that happens. 
because it could be demonic, it could be a chemical imbalance, could be drugs, could be all sorts of stuff. So you got to be careful in that way. That's the physical, the person physically attacking you in some way. Uh, as far as the demons, no, we don't have to worry about them. And the closer we get to them, the more uncomfortable they are. And then they try to make us uncomfortable. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it makes a difference in that way. Uh, as far as, as that going, we don't want to try to cast a demon out of someone unless they are ready to accept the Lord because it could put them in a worse situation. So you just have to have wisdom in all those situations. But you, as a Christian, don't have to fear any demonic thing. You have to fear the people that like demons trying to mob you or something like that. Yeah, in Jasher, it talks about weeks. Is that years or weeks of years? It depends on how um, we'd have to look at it in Hebrew or in context anyway in English because you've got a week of days. That's what we can consider a week. And then a week of years, which is called a Shemitah. And that's just part of their calendar, just like we have decades and centuries. So I don't think we have. Yeah, we're we're good that way. We We only have one word for one thing like that. So it's a different difference in the, the spelling. So we'd have to look it up. So in, in, we'd have to look up that particular one and see. And then sometimes it's cryptic anyway, because it's a week of something. And when it's done, a prophecy happens. So you've got to stop and think, okay, this is a riddle. What kind of weeks are we talking about? How does it fit? You know, because it's supposed to be a secret or, or riddle to figure out. Ah, Prescott says, my birthday is on the 29th of Tammuz. Congratulations. That's cool. And uh, the days of the week are always the same. Like whatever day that is, is the on the 29th is the same. <clears throat> but if you go back, make sure to go back and find out. So, for instance, my birthday is October 9th. It would be different this year on the calendar slightly, give or take three days. But I need to go back to 1965, when the year I was born. Then I'd figure out for sure what it is. Because they're always, you know, slightly different. So that's neat. Oh, okay. Suggestion. Uh, color code events on your calendar to show key events from the past. I'm not familiar with all the layers, but it will give people a footpath to follow. That would be a good idea. One of the things I want to do is down here at the bottom. You can't see that. Hold on a second. Uh, down here at the bottom to add our, well, I think I mentioned that already, but add our, um, yeah, our unas, at least buttons for these so we can pull these up. So that will help. Put all the chronology, time charts, all together under DSS calendar, I think it would help a lot. So let's see here. The only the thing that I've tried so far, and everybody says this looks nice. The only question I have, and you guys can tell me if you think about it, the um, golden color is what it is currently. So it's this Shemitah, this Jubilee, this year of the of the Shemitah in the, in the current Jubilee. And this is the current day of the year. And the rest of these are all kind of blue marbly, except for down here, like these and like up here. This is actually 14th of Nisan. You can figure it out. This is the first. So we go on down to the Tuesday, the 14th. So this would be Passover. And then this is the week of unleavened bread. And it goes on down from that. So these, I mean, just compare it to here, for instance, this and this, they, they look really close. I don't know if people will get confused or not. And I've thought about possibly putting, like if I can, put a little P right here for Passover. Something like that to get them. So we'll find out. I thought about on these, just on these, like today is the 28th. So I could put like a 2-8 right here. Just on the current ones, not on all of them. So there could be different things like that we can do to make it clearer. But yeah, suggestions like that, definitely. Thank you very much. That's what I was trying to do with these, kind of color code them a little bit just throughout the year.
so this would be the flood this is the first day so and then we go on down Okay, lots of good conversations going in here. Just looking to see if there's any more questions because it's 8.30 and we'll probably stop here pretty quick. Yes, we do have a really good group. I think this is to me. What do you feel about 501c3 churches? Oh, yeah, my name's in there. Um, I don't have a problem with it. We're not one. Well, my church is. Uh, I'm Bible Facts Ministries is not, uh, mainly because it, it's not really necessary. The two big things, benefits, are if we have a church building or office building or something like that, then we don't have to pay taxes on it. And then if you give donations, I can send you... Um, a receipt and then you can deduct it from your taxes those are the two big things to that but the that's what you get but the what you have to pay is though you, you can't say anything political and they get to decide what's political so if i say abortion is murder christians don't do that kind of stuff and the guy running for office is pro-abortion so i start saying he's not a good christian don't vote for him i should be able to say that you know, as, as a person, I can say that, free speech. But if I'm a 501c3, they say, ah, oh, you can't do that. That's that Johnson Amendment. And it needs to be taken out because you should be able to say anything you want, freedom of speech. If I'm slandering the guy, then he can sue me in a court of law and take care of it. And that, that would be between me and him. It should have nothing to do with the government. So, so I'm not a 501c3, want to stay away from it. Uh, just for that reason. So, the, yeah, when, when Trump was running, was it Trump? Anyway, I posted something uh, political on Facebook, and somebody reminded me that, you know, you could get your 501c3 pulled for doing this. And, and I was very proud to say, we're not a 501c3. We are a ministry, but we're not. Well, I thought you had to be one. Nope. Churches don't have to do anything. So, but that was, I don't know if he was threatening me or just trying to say, be careful, you might get in trouble. And I definitely could that way. So I, I it, it's kind of a, a, a weird thing. You guys probably remember Jerry Falwell and he had moral majority. He, he just played the game. A church can't say anything political, but a church can own businesses. So the church is a 501c3 over here, the same group of people own a 504R, I think it is, something like that, which is like a political group, okay? And I guess they're not supposed to talk about religion. I don't know. But anyway, so the point is, he have these two groups, like two different websites. So if you were to ask the religious kin, what do you think about Trump? I'd say, I don't know. There's a good, why don't you go to that place over there and see what they say? I kind of like them. You know, if you go over there and say, well, is he godly? Godly? I don't know. Uh, for godly type stuff, why don't you go over to that website and ask them? <laughs> and so it's the same people kind of playing games, not with you, but the religious people didn't talk politics and the politic people did not talk religion. But it's the same people because we have rights to say and believe whatever. And, you know, that's kind of what we ought to be doing, just kind of. The system wants us to do it a certain way. It's stupid, but we need to do what we can do to witness. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. It'll save them a lot of, of time and money. If uh, my church, for instance, got its 501c3 pulled, think if the building is worth a million dollars because you've got, you know, a whole lot of seating. The taxes, think if you had a house that's worth a million dollars, same kind of a deal. 
the taxes on that are going to be horrible. So they pull the 501c3, you may not survive because that's, you know, like a couple thousand dollars a month or better in taxes you'd have to be paying all of a sudden out of the blue. Then if they tried to make you pay back taxes on that. So it's, it's, it's definitely pushed to try to get the churches to be quiet. But they, they don't need to. They can say stuff in other places too. Okay, several people are getting ready to go good night. It's okay. All right. Um, let's see here. Just see if there's anything left. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and say good night then, and we'll be back on Thursday with a Q and A, and I'll probably have some more of this to show you. Uh, we're working on several things to make things better, and I, it'll be really interesting. Um, so yeah, if if you think that um, colors could be different or something like that, let me know. And we'll keep going as we go. We'll put the two uh, the two web pages together and do things like that. I think it'll be really neat to be able to start using this stuff just as an everyday tool. Get us all used to the calendars. Start thinking that way. Because if we use this calendar, if it's the old calendar like they say, it'd be the one we would use in the millennial reign, which is coming up pretty quick. So we might want to get used to it um, as, as well as we do Gregorian. A lot of us are used to the modern Jewish calendar. This is just slightly different. It's basically the same. It's just whenever the new year starts. But everything else is the same. Passover, Pentecost, except there's more holidays and holy days, basically, in there. So we'll work on it. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and say goodnight. Uh, see you guys Thursday. <laughs>